I've been talking about televangelists on my channel for a while, but we haven't done a deep dive into the televangelists themselves. Where'd they come from? How'd they form out their ideology? Why is it so tied up in conservatism in the United States? Let's take a closer look at the history of televangelism. Let's get into it. There have been a number of generations of televangelism, and a lot of it was born from AM radio. There used to be strict political and advertising regulation on radio in its early days. Radio was viewed as something really special, like the invention of the printing press. It was a new way of disseminating information to people. With the invention of the printing press, it meant you could deliver information straight to people's houses in written form. It was an amazing way of staying informed. With the radio, they didn't need a subscription to anything. They didn't need to register their names with any company so they'd receive a copy of the paper. They could just buy this device and tune into a specific station. And people took it really seriously in the beginning. As time went on, it became harder and harder to stay within the confines of the regulations. So things started to loosen up until finally the dam broke and lots of major pieces of regulation on the radio were removed. Now people are pretty much free to say whatever they want. And Christian broadcasters and right-wing extremists, for example Rush Limbaugh, flocked to AM radio. Most televangelists are part of a broader movement called evangelicalism. Not really a specific group, it's more of a category. I've done a video on evangelicals, Pentecostals, and how the two groups are connected, so give that a look if you're curious. But for the most part, these people aren't really accountable to any leadership. They are the leaders of the movement. And being as famous as they are, they're very disconnected from the real world. They have no idea what the average person experiences on a daily basis. So naturally, when they lay down moral guidelines for people, it's completely unrealistic, and it pushes people further and further into extremism. Fulton Sheen is kind of considered to be the first televangelist. Then came Rex Humbard, the first weekly church service broadcaster. Then we got Oral Roberts, aka Moral Oral. He's almost like the father of our modern day televangelism. Most televangelists on the air today were affiliated with or inspired by Oral Roberts in some way. He was born in 1918 and started a quote-unquote university, Oral Roberts University. Next came Jim Baker. He targeted children in his early career. Lots of less than savory allegations flying around about this guy. But I'm going to try to bring only verified facts to the discussion. He was convicted and sentenced to 45 years in prison for fraud. But eventually, the sentence was reduced to eight years and he was released in 1994. He was married to Tammy Faye, who had her day in televangelism, but is pretty well respected for her inclusive views, though still a con artist as far as I'm concerned. Next is Jerry Falwell. He died in 2007 and after his death, Chris Christopher Hitchens said, The empty life of this ugly little Christian proves only one thing, that you can get away with the most extraordinary offenses to morality and to truth in this country if you'll just get yourself called reverend. He was a bad dude, a horrific dude actually, and now his son runs his ministry, Jerry Falwell Jr., and makes regular appearances on Fox News. Then we've got Pat Robertson. He's still on TV today on Christian Broadcast Network, or CBN, on the show The 700 Club. He is extremely influential. Even though religious leaders aren't legally allowed to get involved in politics, they do. They're supposed to lose tax-exempt status, but for some reason, the IRS just isn't interested in pursuing cases against them. Anyways, Pat Robertson actually tried to run for president in 1988 on an interesting campaign, but it kind of fell flat. At least it gave him some publicity, which I suspect is what most presidential candidates are aiming for in the first place. Then we've got Joel Osteen. Again, he's still preaching today. He's particularly renowned for teaching the prosperity gospel. He's worth between 40 and 60 million dollars, but of course we'll never know for sure because he doesn't file taxes. Doesn't have to. Churches are tax exempt. Next is Peter Popoff. Basically everybody I'm listing here is a scam artist, in many cases even convicted, like Jim Baker, but somehow extremist evangelical Christians just don't really care. Completely look past it. Peter Popoff gained popularity from faith healing, but his real claim to fame was that God would reveal people's ailments before the person would tell him. That means he must be the real deal, right? No. Turns out his wife was feeding him information from prayer cards filled out before the performance. He had a little earpiece in, and as he approached people, she would tell him what was bothering them. She'd seem pretty obvious to everybody involved, but it was televised, so the people at home had no idea how it worked. Despite the fact that he was found out, he still bounced back from it. He's filthy rich, 
and still preaching. And that brings us to Kenneth Copeland. This by no means is a complete list of televangelists. The list is huge, but these guys are the biggest and most influential. I've covered Kenneth Copeland a few times on my channel. He's another prosperity gospel leader. Give me your money and God will make you rich. He's also a massive Trump supporter, which you know what, honestly, I couldn't possibly give a shit. I could not care less if I tried. But when you start mixing political messages into your sermons, scamming people out of money, lying to them, and using your political influence to your advantage, even though you aren't legally allowed to involve politics in your religious sermon in the first place, that kind of pisses me off. This guy's net worth is between $300 million and $850 million as of June 2020. He's used God to cure the world of COVID-19 on at least four separate occasions. And he looks like a demon. There, I said it. He looks like a demon. In fact, they all do. I don't know why they all look like demons, but they all tend to look like demons. Maybe their demons come to deceive millions in preparation for the arrival of the Antichrist. Who knows? If I believed in demons, then I'd definitely wager a bet that these guys are working for Satan. But honestly, I'm on Satan's payroll, and I've never seen him over by the water cooler, so who knows. Moving on. In 1979, Jerry Falwell used his fame to push something called the Moral Majority, which encouraged Christians to get more political and vote on specific issues. He went pretty hard against evolution, secularism being taught in schools, and homosexuals. They picked up a bunch of key political issues and ran with it. The organization disbanded in 1989, but they definitely accomplished their goal of politicizing Christians and branding the Republican Party as the political party of evangelical Christians. Lots of points argued by Republicans in the U.S. today are based on Christian values, which is why I will never be a Republican. I might vote for a Republican candidate, probably not, but I might. I might even move toward conservative or libertarian ideas. Again, probably not. Some, maybe. But I will never consider myself a Republican. The party is linked to, supported, and heavily influenced by extremist Christianity. That's just what it is. I know I have some atheist Republicans in my audience. That's okay. I understand we have different views. Differing opinions should be allowed. But I will never be a part of a political party that's so heavily controlled by extremist Christianity. If I can help it. Anyways, most of these guys have similar tactics to find unsuspecting suckers and extract money from them. Let's go through how some of this works. Prosperity gospel is a popular one. It's the idea that if you give your money to God, then he'll bless you with more money. And by give God your money, they mean give me your money. And by he'll give you more, they mean he'll leave you flat broke, but I'll look really cool riding around in this private jet I bought from Tyler Perry. The tactic is largely targeted toward people below the poverty line because one, they're looking for hope somewhere, they can't find it anywhere else. And two, they're most likely to be uneducated, more gullible, and less financially responsible as a result. The next technique is product sales. I've covered this on my channel, but Jim Baker got in some deep shit recently for claiming his silver solution could cure all kinds of stuff, including but not limited to COVID-19. Now he's in hot water with the Arkansas Attorney General. Baker is also famous for selling something called bonus buckets. That's why they call him Bonus Bucket Jim Baker. They're these bonus buckets of food that won't expire for like 30 years, so you're supposed to stockpile these bad boys, and when the rapture comes, you'll be prepared if you're left behind. If you aren't left behind, then your family members who are will be prepared, thanks to you. Of course, they're grossly overpriced. I'm taking a quick gander at his website here, and it looks like the bonus buckets were renamed to Prepared Pantry 60 Meal Bucket. So how much food is actually here? What kind of numbers are we dealing with? Well, I scroll down a little bit, and it says it has 60 meals total. Each meal has 600 calories. The bucket contains a total of 37,400 calories. An average human of average height and weight is supposed to consume about 2,000 calories per day. So if there's just one person consuming these bonus buckets at, say, 1,800 calories a day, since that divides evenly by 600 calories a meal, that means these bonus buckets contain enough food for a single person to eat for about 20 days. But you know the Great Tribulation will last longer than that. You should probably have about seven years of food stockpiled. At least that's what Mormons strive for. So $155 gets you 20 days worth of food. How much money would you need to blow to have enough to get you through the Great Tribulation? About $20,000. Of course, that's just for one person. You're a Christian man, so you have a wife and kids, don't you? You're going to need enough for them too. Having enough bonus buckets to feed four people through the Tribulation means you're dropping about $80,000 on bonus bucket gyms, prepared pantry meal buckets. But look on the bright side. You can use the 
bucket for waste when you're done with it. This is just a basic glimpse into the world of televangelism. It gets a lot worse. I didn't even go into detail about faith healing, which is its own monster, but I'll save that for another time. Anyways, that's all I've got for you. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, there's Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check me out on Teespring, or you can check me out on Etsy. I have a store where I sell all kinds of interesting stuff. Mostly it's 3D printed retro game stands, but I also sell these 2020 dumpster fire candle holders, or just regular dumpster fire candle holders. And I sell these signs. If you want to keep Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons from knocking on your door, put these signs out front. Jehovah's Witnesses aren't afraid of anything except for apostates. And you don't have to be an ex-Jehovah's Witness to be an apostate. The term applies to anybody critical of the religion. So if you want to keep them away, then consider getting one of these. All links can be found in the description and the pinned comment as always. Okay, thanks for watching guys.